recording started. Thank you. Um, we probably should begin in some sort of timely fashion, thanking everybody who's done all the work that's made it possible for this session to be happening now at all. Um, I especially thank uh, Liz and Marion, who are in the room at the moment, John Bounds, who's been in the background, and everybody who's uh, going to be helping as an expert participant, whether or not they've been discovered yet. <laughs> um, guest speakers, I see Jenny McNess and Sylvia in the room. So there have been a lot of people that have helped pull this together, and it's really nice seeing it, seeing it start to happen. So this is, this is a brief welcome to FSLT. Um, Liz, do you want to say hi, test your microphone? I thought I'd already done that, but hi, is my microphone working? Yeah, it's working fine. Thanks, Liz. Marion, um, you're in there hi. as well. Hi, Marion. Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Can right. you hear me? Thanks a lot. Yeah, hear you loud and clear. Marion, you'll be keeping an eye on the text chat and uh, alert me. Liz, you've yes. got your hand up. I just wanted to um, make the point at this stage before we get too far into it to let people know that private messages they send between each other can be seen by the moderators. So those of you who started sending private messages to each other, if you're about to start to say how awful George is, maybe take it to back channels instead. And if you have a quiet word with Liz, she'll tell you where those back channels are, I'm sure. <laughs> OK. Um, thank you. Yes. That's just anonymizing as well. Hi, John. Oh, excellent. Oh, hi, John. Um, so yes, this is what we're going to do this afternoon, go through, um, uh, settle in, which is what we're doing now, walk through the Collaborate interface, quick walk through the course. Um, Marianne will talk about research and open academic uh, practice. I'll talk about open academic practice, and then we'll have uh, finish it off with open questions and answers. Um, yeah, a little bit of uh, introduction to openness here, I suppose. Um, so walking through Collaborate, I thought I would try to start with a little bit of an advanced Collaborate exercise to say, uh, those of you who know how to use the, pol the polling system, go and find the poll and answer um, I have used Collaborate or similar virtual learning environment a many times, uh, the occasionally, and, and so on. Um, a few times, once or twice, or not at all. And I just wanted to gauge a sense of uh, the experience in the room. I can see we've got four A's, four B's, two C's, four D's. So there's a fair amount of experience in the room, but also some people who have never used it. Um, boats are starting to come in uh, uh, a few times is pulling ahead and many times is <laughs> oh there we go oh gosh um, okay so I, I mean I don't want to spend an awful lot of time telling people how then there's the there's the poll published so uh, a oh so no okay no answer is different from D which is the answer not at all. So uh, nine people, 27 people have not responded to the poll. Of the people who responded, 21% uh, said not at all and so on. Um, so there's a bit of a sort of a dip around once or twice. Um, people either haven't used it or they have used it. <laughs> OK, thank you. And well, there we go. I've used Collaborate. Um, so just a quick walk through for those that haven't used it. Um, can I ask you to give me a quick smiley face if you're hearing me clearly enough and I'm not going too fast or too slow? Excellent. 
Thank you. Um, right, smiley faces appearing on both sides of the screen. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, there is a um, walkthrough to collaborate, which is probably most easily accessed right from um, here. And we can paste an address into the chat. So I could paste an address into the chat. Unfortunately, the um, the URLs on the whiteboard are not clickable. So we can't click on the whiteboard to go to the go wherever we would want. Um, uh, the pretty much sounding very clear at the moment. Uh, I, I'm a bit nervous because it doesn't usually sound this good all the time. Um, uh, I assume that everybody's either got a headset, got headphones, or has a really good uh, noise suppressing microphones because at the moment I don't hear any feedback through the system. So thank you everybody for arriving promptly and reasonably well kitted out for, for the Collaborate environment. Um, so the, the course environment, um, or the, the Collaborate window, if I call it that. The Collaborate window is a collection of a number of windows. This is a shot from an earlier project, a slightly earlier, uh, depending on your machine and what sort of Java you have, you may have a slightly different look to your Collaborate across the, the world. But the point to make is that each element of the screen can be picked up and dragged around and put somewhere else. So uh, because I'm working on the laptop, I have things all kind of squeezed up and cramped around. Um, but you can change the look of your Collaborate screen. And you can always, under the View menu, wherever that might be, depending on whether you're Windows or Macintosh, you'll be able to restore the default layout if everything gets um, very, very confused. Um, so what I thought we would do is just have a look at, make sure everybody understands the user tools. There are, there are a number of areas. There's the uh, participants area, the chat area, the video area, the sound area, and of course the whiteboard. Um, moving on to the next. Just to make sure people know where the user tools are, I've asked you to give me a smiley. And there's two places where you can do this. Uh, one is in the actual participant window. If you click on the uh, little drop down, you get a number of smiley faces. So uh, you might laugh out loud at, uh, at some of the humor that I try to <laughs> put into the, into the program. Um, so you can do smileys. You can do out of the room, um, which simply puts up uh, a sign saying away whether you are or not. Um, raising your hand to speak. And uh, kindly, if after you've raised your hand to speak, if you could put it back down again. Um, and Liz and Marion will try to help me to monitor hand raising. If anybody has any questions to interject, just click on, on that button. And uh, the clicking to talk, at the moment it's set up so that four people could talk simultaneously. But it's generally good practice to turn off your microphone if you're not speaking. And remember, when you turn on your microphone, there's a delay of a half a second or something like that. So turn on the microphone, pause, then start speaking. Don't turn on the microphone and blurt straight into a sentence, because it'll miss the first word or two. Okay. Um, yes, we will be recording the session. Uh, we mentioned this um, recording will be publicly available. And we could do what we've sometimes done is uh, change the polling. And if we go to uh, the polling, uh, polling type, yes, no option. Um, and I could ask people um, to indicate a red yes if they are OK with us recording these sessions, or possibly a black uh, red cross uh, to say, well, I really would rather it weren't. Um, so 
give us a sense of the room. The, the sense of the room is building strongly in favor of um, of recording. Thank you very much. Uh, if, if anything does get recorded and anybody finds that something is somehow misrepresents them or they would rather not have it up there, just let us know and we'll take it away. We'll either edit it out of the uh, track or we'll just take the track down. We don't want anybody to be um, compromised or upset by anything that might accidentally get out onto the the, the, the wild internet. Um, Um, at the end of the day, make sure at the end of the session, make sure you actually exit the session because the recording can't be saved until everybody's left the room. Uh, in, in practice, the moderators can forcibly exit people, but if you could just remember to shut your system down before you go, that makes it a tidy, a tidy ending. Um, introduction to the course. Wow, <laughs> we're here. Thank you all very much for joining. Really, really pleased. Uh, <laughs> where is uh, giving? Uh, I'm giving you all a round of applause for uh, for making it into the room, for making it into the Moodle, um, for getting the course content and uh, activities built out um, in time. Here be dragons. It's always a bit of a trip into the unknown, and for me, the unknown factor I think this time is going to be how the peer feedback system works. Um, a lot of that, we're, we're using um, enough tools that we have never used before to um, heighten the uh, anxiety in order to sort of try and keep us on our toes. Um, so hopefully, hopefully we aren't um, using too much novelty or introducing too much novelty into the, um, into the session. Um, you'll have seen this map, and this map will appear several times. Everybody still with me? Everybody okay if I just keep trundling on like this? There's a smiley face from Anna, somebody approving. Excellent. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Haley. Um, uh, smiley faces, smiley faces. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's sometimes just useful to get some uh, feedback from the room, uh, making sure that I actually have my microphone on when I talk and things like that. So yes, there's a map. This map will appear on the Moodle. It'll appear on the uh, WordPress site. Um, just to say we're start, we're in the first week zero at the moment. Um, we'll be going up until the 14th of June, during which time there are six topics, three guest speakers and four activities. Um, I think I did that slightly in the wrong order, but anyway. Three guest speakers next week. Jenny McNess will be um, doing it on Wednesday from 4 till 5 in Collaborate on, on Open Academic Practice. Hello, Jenny. And I see Jenny in the room. I don't know if you want to say hello to us now, but um, Sylvia Curry is also in the room. She's going to be talking about tools to support openness. And Chris Christman, um, similarly, hi, Chris, will be um, leading a live session on new blends, blended learning, um, flip teaching, um, the, the way that the virtual and the, the so-called real um, intersect. That might be one way of putting it. Um, six topics, supporting learning, reflective practice, teaching small groups, lecturing, feedback, and evaluation. And you can see these here. Four activities. And these are, the, these are where we're uh, taking a bit more of a risk, I guess. Um, the reflective statement and collaborative bibliography will use uh, a Moodle workshop tool to randomly allocate people up to four assignments to give feedback on, and consequently each person would have the chance to receive four um, doses of feedback on uh, their their reflective statement. So the, fir the first two exercises, we use that 
uh, mechanism for uh, um, uh, arranging for peer feedback. And the micro teaching and virtual conference activities will use the select um, select group tool to select times in which uh, groups of five people can get up to up to five people can get together to discuss either the micro teaching example or the virtual conference example. Um, we're as excited to see how it will work as you are, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, Lindsay, you used it back in 2008. It worked fine. No worries. Thank you very much for that. Um, <laughs> we'll come to you for help when it, uh, yeah, it should work. It should work. Great little tool. Um, multiple modes of engagement. Um, I've seen blogs coming in. Uh, as of this morning, there were seven, I think, um, or eight discussion forums that are kicking off open discussion. Um, oh, yes, but we can use this space uh, as an open discussion room um, quite freely. In other words, you saw how you logged in. You can still log into this space. And there's even a guest, um, there's a, a guest moderator log on, a generic moderator log on that one person can pick up the moderation. And so this room can be used for um, recording micro-teaching activities, for example. Um, there's the, anything you want to do with it that you can do with it outside the scheduled time. Um, multiple modes of engagement, assessments and certificates. Um, can I see just a, a show of hands over there? How many people in the audience are among those that are doing it for assessment? Dodsworg. Excellent, Louise. Hello. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, okay. So there's a few people in there, yes. So this is the first running of the course after it was successfully, um, I'm not quite sure what the word is, validated, accredited by Oxford Brooks towards the Postgraduate Certificate in Teaching in Higher Education. Um, yeah, so a 10 credit module. Uh, we think we're one of the first um, of the open online courses to have assessment in it. Um, in the UK, anyway, there have been others, and there there are there are examples and models around. Um, so those people who are doing it for assessment will get uh, tutor feedback on at least one of the activities. Um, I'd like to say all of them, but I can't guarantee that you'll do them all. <laughs> um, but those of you who do the reflective statement, collaborative bibliography, and micro teaching will certainly get commentary on those from a tutor. The virtual conference is what counts. That is, if you like the exam. Um, if you're doing it for assessment, those of you that are being tactically strategic, all you really have to do is the virtual conference. Uh, but I wouldn't tell you that, would I? Um, because certainly we hope that you join in throughout and. Um, and enjoy the enjoy the course with everybody. Our approach: we talk a lot. You're responsible for your own learning. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about openness and social construction, I guess, in a minute. Uh, that's a bit redundant for what's coming up. Um, and research informed. Marion will be talking a little bit about research in a minute. Yeah, day one. Um, as of uh, this morning, there were 260 people signed up, 12 for assessment. How massive is massive? Um, many people are postgraduate research students going into uh, seminar leading sessions, those kind of things. Um, up to, I think there were 20 expert participants that had been identified, mostly prior participants and experienced teachers from around, from around the place. So it's great to have uh, these networks sort of preceded um, and expanding. Uh, oh, I don't need to go into that. Um, just to say that there is a structure to the thing um, that hangs together around a model of open educational resources. The UK professional standards framework. Um, all of this does tie together. So Marion, over to you on expert participants, please. Okay. Um, yeah, as George said, we've got 20 people who um, have been identified or identified themselves as expert participants. And this is um, 
this role of expert participant um, has very much been influenced by our evaluation of FSL T12. Um, what we found from our research is that um, in, in MOOCs like this, or if it is a MOOC or OOC, Opener Online Course, um, what you tend to get, you get people who have never, some people have never been on an online course before, some people have never been on a MOOC before, some people are completely new to higher education, um, as opposed to people who've got lots of experience with online education, um, people who've participated in other MOOCs, uh, people who've got lots of experience in, in, in higher education. So um, what we've decided, what we found last year was that there were some very valuable relationships um, developed between those two groups of people, but we felt that perhaps we wanted to maximise on that this year. So we've got about 20 volunteers. They are either past participants of FSL T12 or people who are experienced in teaching and learning roles in, in higher education. But of course, um, we um, acknowledge the expertise of all the people who join um, First Steps in Teaching and Learning. Um, and obviously, we wouldn't want to uh, suggest that any participants were different in any way or superior in any way from anybody else. And um, it's still not too late if this, if this you know, um, if you feel it's a role that you'd like to join up for, um, then just let us know and, 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 and you can join the network. Um, and really the role for expert participants is um, principally to help to moderate the discussion forums. Each, each, topic, um, each, each topic has a discussion forum. And, uh, just keeping my eye on the chat window and, and Jenny saying that the word expert is problematic and yeah we agree Jenny it, it probably is problematic but hopefully we might get a chance to perhaps explore what it means in a MOOC through the research. Did you want to um, say something? Can you, I hope you can hear me. Can, uh, good. <laughs> oh, only because um, yeah. It always worries me if um, if I'm ever referred to as an expert, um, and sometimes that occasionally, surprisingly, that does happen, and and I it makes me feel very uncomfortable. So um, um, that's that's all really. Just wanted to share that. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Lindsay's used the word plant, but yeah, um, but I think yeah, it, it it does it does have connotations. The word expert definitely, but really, what we're looking for is helping to moderate discussion forums. Those of you who participated in MOOCs before, and we've had our own experience in, in participation in MOOCs, the discussion forums can be very very overwhelming. And um, if you can imagine, if you're new to an online course and you come in and there's thousands and thousands of discussion posts, there is that feeling about um, where do I, um, where, where do I fit in? Somebody's got their hand up that I can't see. I don't know who's, if somebody wants to say something. Chris has had his hand up for a minute, Mary. Chris Green. Hi, Chris. Maybe just, uh, a button error or a hand raising or a microphone. Yeah. Um, I heard two, two, two buzzers, but never mind. Um, no, the so other one was me trying to draw your attention to Chris. Right, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. <laughs> Chris, no? Carry on, Mary. Yeah, okay. Um, to help moderate the discussion forums um, and to facilitate the feedback on the Micro teach and um, the virtual conference, which are activities for this year. And as I say, you you may wish to volunteer for that role. Any questions about that before I move on to the next slide? Okay, so we really want to build on the research that we undertook last year. If you're interested in what we did last year, then our research papers are on the main WordPress site. I think they're under the research heading. Is that right, George? 
that correct? Um, yes, I mean, uh, yes, it's correct. I'll just go and grab the link and I'll paste it into the chat yeah. uh, window. So we really want to build on the outcomes of that, that research. We're very interested in how and why people learning and move, and we're really interested in the learner experience. And obviously, um, we're implementing peer feedback this year, which we didn't have last year. So we want to be able to explore what that experience is like, and um, for want of a better word, the impact of the expert participant roles. Um, we've applied for ethical approval from our university, um, so all of the consent forms, etc., will be on the WordPress site. And in addition to that, you will get an you will each get an invitation to participate in our research. And I think um, last year we gathered a lot of data. There's a lot of data that um, uh, James, yeah, from the Re University Research Ethics Committee at Brooks. That's right, James. Yeah. Um, last year we um, gathered a lot of data. There's a lot of data that you can gather from a MOOC, but this year we want to do things slightly differently. And what we'd really like to do is have a, a small group of participants who would be who would agree to be interviewed over the course of the MOOC as their experiences are emerging. So you'll each be invited, everybody, irrespective of your um, experience in a MOOC before to participate in that. And we'll also circulate a survey which we'd like everyone to complete, which will have very similar, um, we'll be looking at, at very similar um, themes. Is there anything you want to add, George or Jenny, because uh, Sylvia, because you've been, well, we've all kind of collaborated on the, the research. Is there anything that you can think? Um. Did you meant? Uh, sorry, I was uh, I was going, finding I was chasing the links down around the internet. Um, and you did mention that this concept of call it what you will the um, a, a community where people have some uh, recognizably um, acknowledged role of guide, plant, um, mm -hmm. expert, participant, so on. How how that um, can be yeah. sustained? I guess. Um, yeah. that there are community questions about you know what what it might mean um, certainly uh, the University of Brooks is committed to running it again um, we think that having people from the previous runs sort of present and active and engaged is you know, it's, is beneficial so how that how that works? I guess that's that's the main. I guess thing it, I, also yeah. based on some of the people that have come forward, um, who perhaps are very experienced in higher education, but haven't participated in a MOOC before, but can still are in a position to to support other people. It will be very interesting to see how they think that this might influence their own practice in running online courses or or, or running MOOCs. Okay, I'll hand back to George. Thank you. Um, uh, can I just ask if there's any questions in the room about, um, call it what you will, the sort of the role of the person who has some kind of experience, um, the expert participant role as it's been being described. Um, everybody happy enough with that at the moment? Show me a little smiley face if I should move on. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, David. Emma. Uh, I'll take that as uh, some reasonable assent that, that we should press on. Um, open academic practice. Really, this is just a frame, you know, so sort of get your mind um, into the sort of place it should be in for uh, Jenny's session next week. Um, openness is a uh, is a problem in higher education in education generally there's been discussions about what it means to be open ever since the open university and probably even before then um, there's a lot of interesting uh, posts out there in the blogosphere last year um, 
there was one on uh, Ifuko Ranamuk, um, which talked about the responsibility of uh, higher education institutions to provide um, open courses at the highest levels. So we're all sort of playing into this into this field of open academic practice. Um, we are using open educational resources and we're creating open educational resources and we reused a lot of stuff from FSLT 12 in our face-to-face -face courses this year. Um, again, Neil, who's uh, recovering in Croatia from, from doing all of that, has uh, been using uh, a lot of the resources that we pulled together for FSLT 12 has used them for flipped classroom teaching models in our current uh, associate teachers course. Um, so there are broad senses of um, open educational resources in a more strict sense. Um, I suppose there will be discussions about what that might mean. There are some open academic practices which we are keen to um, model, uh, stimulate, use in practice through the course. The idea of distributed collaboration, both local and wide area. Um, so there's quite a few people at Brooks who are taking the course this time around who uh, may be as distant to one another as you know, I am from people in Canada or wherever, Finland. Um, and they, you know, so, so distance doesn't necessarily have to be uh, over vast geographical spaces. There can be uh, institutional distance as well. Um, the idea of social citation is picked up in the second of the activities, um, uh, week two, the distributed collaborative bibliography. But the idea now that as academics we should all be using, to put it bluntly, reference management software to uh, publish and keep track of the links and the things you read and the things that you cite and you should share the things that you cite with people and, uh, and mostly we do. Um, a concern with mobile learning, concern with uh, widening access, which always does have then this social or global justice edge to it. Um, open access uh, does imply some sort of uh, beneficent or altruistic um, side. And um, just started thinking in terms of pedagogies of engagement recently, um, the idea that inquiry-led, research-based, evidence-informed, modeling practice, and this is sort of a, say modeling, not just modeling practice in professional communities, but actually intending to have an impact on practice. In other words, research that is acknowledges that it has a slant on changing the world in a certain way. Watching in stereo. <laughs> MOOC experts could upload a gravitar with a star or something. <laughs> Dave Aldridge, we're like ships. I know you don't have a mic, Dave. What does that mean? OK, um, moving right along. Um, pay attention to that pedagogies of engagement. It might become important. Um, but we believe that open academic practice is an element of best academic practice. This is an assertion that we made in our application for the teaching development grant from the Higher Education Academy. Yes, Dave on the iPad. Uh, Liz? Hello, Dave. Hi, can I just see if my mic works, George? Yeah, that's loud and clear. Perfect. I was just going to explain that that was because, you know, you said we were distant across the institution. Um, oh, yeah. Was just, that was all. Um, but my mic works, which is great. <laughs> Hurrah. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah, so we made assertions that open academic practice was an element of best academic practice. <coughs> I'm not sure how we would test that one. Um, and if we want lecturers and institutions to be among the world's leading universities, we have to adopt uh, somehow open academic practice on uh, an open academic platform. So um, sort of saying that that's what we think we would like to do. That's, that's one of the driving factors behind uh, this initiative. 
Um, let's suppose we're into the open questions on on the course. I don't have a lot more to say in the the formal sense, so it really is over to you. Get no video on the iPad. I don't know, David. Is that uh, that's a good question? Uh, I'm not just I'm not playing any video. Uh, the iPad experience is not full. <laughs> uh, okay, well, there's an interesting technological uh, discussion going on in the corner about iPads and iOS devices. Um, hello, Lisa, MTU, joining the session. If you're just joining the session now, you'll probably be mighty confused about what's going on. But we've just come to the end of a quick overview of the course, the structure of the course, the timing of the course, and the underpinning educational philosophy, I suppose, or at least some of the underpinning educational philosophy of the course. And I wanted to take a deep breath now and ask if there are any questions in the room. Um, it, it's a time when, if this were a big lecture, I'd say, turn to your neighbor. and. Uh, have a quiet moment to reflect together. Um, and then if we could come back with some questions that you might have about uh, what is daunting to you about this course, what is exciting for you about this course, um, what challenges might you anticipate. Um, hello, Anne. Yes, go ahead. Hi. I'm, not sh I'm testing my mic, so hopefully it's working. It's my very first move. Loud and clear. Very first online course, and in going through the web information, I must admit I'm a little overwhelmed by all the technology and how this all works. So, um, what is the next step? Hello. Okay. The next the next step is to remember to turn your microphone on before you start talking. Um, that's an excellent question, and I think really that's the um, one of the key things for today. Um, the, there was a there were a list of uh, outcomes that I wanted people to achieve in week zero. Um, I'll put a link up to that. But basically, the next step is to move into the week one topic, which is reflective practice, and the week one. Um, activity, which is posting an initial reflective statement, the week one activity. So each week has a topic, an activity, and a live session. So if you've arrived in the course, if you've registered on the Moodle, if you've enrolled in the um, course, and I suppose that, like, we could almost do that as a poll as well. Um, I wonder if people, let me, I'm going to set, yes, the poll is set to yes, no. Can I ask this room to give me a green tick if you have enrolled in the course on the Moodle learning environment? A uh, quick spin up to 15, 16, 17, 21, 23, 24, 27. Excellent. Um, so, but that's not everybody in the room, is it? Uh, it's, it's about three quarters of everybody in the room. Um, uh, there's 46 people in the room, and 30 of them. Uh, of course, I haven't indicated my own positive tick, so I suppose I can add one in there. Um, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, the next step for those people who have not. Uh, joined uh, the Moodle virtual learning environment uh, would be to consider whether you wish to engage in the uh, discussion forums around the topics and activities, uh, in which case then please do join in. Um, you can follow all of the discussions without having to post into the forums, but uh, I think it's 
Live Evidence, you, you, can, you can participate through your blogs and Twitter. You don't need to participate through the Moodle. But if you wanted to engage in the peer uh, feedback activities, you would have to use the tools in the Moodle to do that. Um, so uh, the other thing is, is that I was hoping to control email communication by routing um, email to people who had subscribed to the news forum in Moodle, rather than trying to keep track of um, a manual mailing list. Um, so I've been sending mailings out to everybody who is registered on the course at all. I intend to stop doing that at the end of tomorrow and use the Moodle as the email vector um, to send announcements out about where the course updates are appearing. So you will have seen that I've sent messages through the Moodle saying uh, this is the next. So this morning, there was about midday, there was a message saying the next thing to do was to come to this session today. Um, the next thing after that is going to be to step into the um, activity and topic forums in week one. Uh, it's a bit of a long, bit of a long answer, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Uh, the, yeah, go ahead, Marion. I just wonder if you wanted to get people to put some questions on the whiteboard. Ah, yes, indeed. We didn't go through the whiteboard tools, but if you notice on the, I've been sort of put, poking a finger around. If you notice on the whiteboard, somewhere on your screen, there will be uh, tools which you can pick up, and somebody's written hello, um, uh, hi. And so on. You can, yeah, <laughs> lots of lots of things appearing on the screen all of a sudden. And you can change the size of the text that you type in. Um, so if if you have a look at the text um, and you select it, you can actually get a, a tool somewhere. Where do the text editing tools go? Um, but yeah, there's text editing tools. You can change the size of the fonts. Yeah, and the colors of the fonts. <laughs> Hurrah! Yes, um, chaos. To face the whiteboard, please. And um, <laughs> turning off the email avalanche. Yeah. Uh, Emma, Emma, yes, Liz has responded to Emma Webster, who asked about posting a direct link to the instructions to turn off the email avalanche. Uh, RSS option in Moodle is turned on. I think so, Sylvia. Um, yes, week zero is uh, when, uh, when we can do all this stuff. Uh, Dave Aldridge can't do something on the iPad. Scribble on the screen. Ah, oh, it's a shame, David. <laughs> Um, Marion, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Not that I can think of, no. I think that's been pretty thorough. <laughs> a, a pretty th thorough discussion of the, of the whiteboard. All right. Um, everybody can uh, down tools. No, you don't need to down tools. Um, there's not. Um, is there? Um, okay, so questions about topics. Does anybody have any questions about the topics that underlie the course? Uh, George, how long should this be? Ah, oh, Haley, how, thank you, Haley. Um, it's, at this stage, it is a bit of a piece of a string. If you're counting words, it probably should not be more than 1,000 words, um, and, and possibly the shorter, the better in some ways. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, 
sitting on the iPad. This was sitting on the iPad. Okay, Haley. So did everybody get that? Um, we want to inculcate um, a practice of what I'll call professional critical reflection. Um, that's mentioned in a couple of places, um, but the, it's one of the principles that underlies our approach to um, developing lecturing in higher education. And by critical, I suppose we mean, um, I, I tend to mean Stephen Brookfield's um, critical reflective, uh, becoming a critical reflective practitioner. Um, where he has a particular focus on how to reflect. So reflection as something which uh, might be structured according to some outside framework, which might refer to the, the author, if I can call him that, you, the author's inner state, but as much looks at what happened in light of um, practice and um, feedback. Ah, Chris, yes, you saw Brookfield in action the other day. Um, was it was it inspiring? <laughs> uh, Chris says yes. Oh, good. I, I like his writing. I find I find he's worth coming back to. Um, I don't know if that's just uh, me letting my gray hair show, but you think the world will have more virtual university than nobody will go to school? I don't think so, Bandar. Uh, it's a, another very good question, though. Um, can I get a sense from the room that you're happy to have a free-flowing conversation with uh, between the text and me talking? Uh, smiley faces if we're happy to go on like this for another five minutes. Uh, Haley's approving. Yes, okay. Um, I would invite other people to pick up the mic, though. Anybody that uh, is uh, tired of me talking, Stephanie. Will these conversations be recorded? Yes, they are being recorded. Um, left mine on the desk at work. Um, yeah, the, the conversation is being recorded, and the recording will be available at the same link on the same page that I posted a link to previously. Um, I'll post it to it again. Um, so from that link there, loads of stuff on Brookfield, and yeah, you're right, Liz. Um, we're big Brookfield fans, us. Um, I like that Brookfield uh, gets right in and um, says that uh, things become critical when considerations of the power differentials which undergird our practice are brought into discussion. Um, so I think, uh, I think Brookfield's really got his finger on what's happening, um, both the beneficent as well as the uh, less benevolent side of the internet and the whole online phenomenon. Because <coughs> I do see this as a contested space. Um, I, I use spatial metaphors and spatial theories a lot for talking about online environments. Go ahead, uh, Liz, Marion, Lou, Louise, Marion. I think I must have still got my hand up from before. It isn't me. OK. Uh, Louise, you've got your hand up? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, OK. Um, just jumping ahead, just, just a question about jumping ahead to the micro, uh, the micro teach, yeah. Uh, but you mentioned earlier yeah. that we could use the Collaborate Classroom to record a micro teach. Can it be used? Is it possible to use it live, or would that not work? Because it wouldn't be a synchronous. Yes, you could. Um, you could do it live. The, yeah. the, um, the thing about the micro teach slot is that you have no more than 10 minutes to do something. Mm -hmm. you, the micro teaching practice is uh, four or 
or at the most five people in a room like this together. Each person has 20 minutes, 10 minutes to present, and 10 minutes to receive feedback from the other three or four people in the room. So you do your thing, talk about it, move on to the next person who then does their thing, talk about it, move on to the next person. So what you need to prepare is a 10-minute um, example, which could be a live presentation in a room like this. Or it could be the playback of an edited recording of a thing like this. Um, yes. Uh, another just, thing that, that, that's again? That's very helpful. But I just thought, um, sort of, as, get, as I say, thinking ahead, to uh, kind of four or five people in the classroom sort of teaching something live could, could, could be possible. And might be a bit ambitious, but so. Yes, it <laughs> it might be a bit ambitious. You might, I mean, what we often do is you should think of the other three people as your audience. In other words, you kind of role play it, where you pretend that they are three first year biology students, or three first year business study students, or three first, you know, master's level engineers, or whatever you teach, you pretend that they are, uh, they are your kind of uh, student. And you you give a example, an exemplar or an extract, a 10-minute extract from what you do. But given that it's micro teaching in an online context, and that sometimes it's difficult to organize that, we've had micro teachings where people have presented learning designs. They presented a lesson plan and discussed the intention of their lesson plan. We have had people record live sessions. Um, yeah, there, so there's been quite a wide variety. You could do a, um, you could do a similar sort of activity as you do for the virtual conference. I'd rather keep the PowerPoint, the virtual conference presentation to the virtual conference, but you could also see how the tools and images that you might use could be similar for both the virtual conference and the micro teaching. There's no reason why the virtual conference couldn't be a sort of, if you like, the theory and backgrounds to your micro-teaching thing, um, that, would, that would work. So you know, try to be license creativity in going through the activities. I really like that screen. I think we should uh, make sure we, well, it'll be recorded, so I guess we will have the screenshot of it. Uh, Penny Mosavian doesn't understand Twitter at all. No, I've got no idea how it works. Um, <laughs> well, it works sort of like this chat room, only with the whole world. Um, what's happening in uh, FSLT 13? So, yeah, good. There are a few people. Um, just a, <laughs> uh, what, what Twitter does is give people opportunities to make comments behind your back when you don't notice them. <laughs> and uh, heckle the lecturer. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Well, I always like to conclude with this slide. Um, the struggle does continue, and it is um, an interesting one. Uh, I think I've said it a couple of times that really the only reason we do this is that we love teaching, and um, I see something special and important in sort of rising into that, um, that identity, that role identity as a teacher in higher education. Um, so that's, um, that's my, little, uh, my little homily for the moment. Um, thank you all, and good luck for the course. Uh, we don't have to leave now. It's, uh, there are indeed six minutes left in the session. Um, <laughs> Having run over time for the last uh, two or three, uh, I feel it's it's quite um, polite if we say we've gone for 55 minutes. Uh, happy to leave the microphone in the room open. Um, I should show one more slide, which is the um, the there we go copyright and takedown notice. Um, we didn't speak about 
in detail about different aspects of openness, but notice that on most of the content you'll find a uh, Creative Commons uh, share alike, uh, um, a attribution share alike license on all of the materials. Um, we've taken away the non-commercial uh, because actually I don't see how um, higher education could call itself non-commercial any longer. Um, or at least it's problematic um, when you, so attribution share alike um, uh, is, is the minimum. So the attribution is that everybody, uh, they can get it for free. You can resell it if you like, but uh, you can't own the content of the course. It's really um, hypothetical, I suppose. Um, we're trying to uh, adopt a fairly education-friendly form of rights holder, where the presumption is on um, the academic institution's right to use uh, content um, unless somebody can uh, prove that it is being misused. So the burden of proof on the rights holder rather than the burden of proof on the putative um, abuser of the content. So. Um, for example, the previous slide that I showed um, that probably does have an origin somewhere, but it's been photographed and rephotographed and rephotographed and rephotographed and rephotographed. Re so I don't know who originated that particular version of that particular image. Um, what? Are there oh, any questions? So, the slides hello, go ahead. That slide. Sorry? It's last year's and it talks about the private room and all sorts of stuff. Ah! That, that slide. <laughs> that slide is out of date. Yes, it is. You're right. Let's go away from that slide. <laughs> um, thank you for noticing that. I thought I had gone through all of them and changed all of them, and I clearly hadn't. Um, but yes, so that's a bit of a leftover from last year. Do apologize, Jenny. It's Jenny McNess next week, not Francis Bell. Um, Jenny McNess takes us into openness. You're right, Susan. Um, Lisa and T. Lisa, have you found the forums? Uh, Lisa, and to you, what do you like about the slide? Oh, the, what, the La Lucha Continua slide. Um, uh, it, well, for me, I read into it a whole um, approach to Frarian, a Frarian approach to education, education that emerges from communities using the language of that community to uh, gain control, if you like, autonomy over the ways of speaking. I think Freire might have called it enunciation. We might call it discourse. But to gain some control over the discourse in your field. OK, Louise. Cheerio. Uh, Paige Mills, Panic Averted. Uh, oh, sorry, that was fun. Good to see you on both laptop and Kindle. Thanks, Susan. Cheerio, everybody. Um, don't forget to log out. Marion, Liz, anything um, urgent that we have to? There's my little boy coming across the garden in a raincoat. <laughs> that must mean it's time to log out. Cheers, Meg, Emma, Bandar, Liz. Thanks, everybody. Gosh. 59 minutes, and we're moving out. I think, uh, Liz, can you stop the recording now, please?